The murder of George Floyd by a policeman sparked the biggest civil rights protests in America's history. Millions took to the streets to denounce racism and police brutality. The movement resonated around the world. A year later, some progress has been made in America. Police reform legislation is spreading across the country, and the officer responsible for Floyd's death is in jail. But the pandemic has exposed how racism can literally be a matter of life or death. In America, black people are almost twice as likely to die from COVID-19 as white people. Black patients were turned away because they seemed like they were well oxygenated when in fact they were actually quite ill. A year after George Floyd's murder, Economist journalists spoke to subscribers about how the pandemic has illuminated the systemic racism in America. COVID-19 has killed African-Americans at, at higher rates, right? So somebody looking at that might say, well, that's, that's racism. But if so, kind of how is it racism? How does that operate? What COVID showed us is that the existing disparities, like lack of access to quality health care, lack of access to pharmacies, lack of access to good jobs, um, uh, good primary care physicians, um, health insurance, can have huge impacts um, beyond just that immediate thing, right? It's not just that grandma can't get her, far, her uh, medication. It's not just that um, you know, you don't have a doctor that you like, though those are all really important. But when it comes down to a pandemic, when it comes down to public health of everyone, um, these disparities have an impact that impacts those communities, but also others. Um, so I think that COVID did a really, did, while it's devastating, it did a good job of illuminating how impactful these racial disparities are both for the communities that are directly impacted, like Black uh, Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, et cetera, but also how it impacts elders who might otherwise not have been aware of those disparities. I think one of the interesting things here to maybe highlight is often those disparities are not caused because somebody somewhere in particular is acting in bad faith, right? You had an interesting piece for the science uh, section of The Economist recently, about pulse oximeters, those devices that we've all become quite um, familiar with that measure blood oxygen levels and, and are you know, pretty useful when working out um, whether somebody who has COVID-19 is, is sick enough to need to go to um, the ER or, or A&E, as Brits would call it, the emergency room. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Usually when we think about racism, um, particularly in America, we think about it individually, right? We think of this individual person is racist and they do something that um, is bad, right? They, they discriminate, they yell, um, they refuse service. But what we're seeing um, in the past few years, especially with George Floyd's murder, is this acknowledgement of the structural um, aspects of racism. And one of the things that, that makes that really clear is the story, as you mentioned, of the pulse oximeter. So the pulse oximeter, Many of you have probably experienced it. Um, it. It's something that goes right onto the end of your finger when you go to the hospital or to the doctor. And essentially it looks at your pulse, but also your um, oxygen levels. And it's used to determine if somebody is um, has low oxygen and, and is ill. And when we had at the peak of the pandemic a need to triage patients, uh, many people were sent home if it seemed like their oxygen levels were actually um, high enough that they were likely not in trouble. They could go home um, and and wait it out and maybe get better or return when they were getting worse. Um, some people were even given these pulse oximeters at home to monitor. Unfortunately, what we're finding is that the way the pulse oximeter works was actually causing black people or darker skinned people to look like they had higher oxygen levels than they actually did. So it works by passing light through the finger um, and or other parts of your body, like maybe your earlobe. And when you pass light through your finger, clearly what comes, what it goes through is your skin. And the darker pigmented uh, skin was uh, responding differently than lighter pigmented skin. And since it was calibrated against white skin, um, the researchers were likely white, um, uh, the test subjects were, were predominantly white. Um, it being calibrated against white skin meant it was more accurate against white skin. So what ended up happening, and it's possible that happened, is that 
black patients were turned away because they seemed like they were well oxygenated when in fact they were actually quite ill. So this is a great example. There was not, a, as far as we know, there was a nurse wasn't looking at somebody and said, oh, you're black, uh, you don't need help. And you know, or even more implicitly, they weren't thinking necessarily that we, this person doesn't need help. Though we do know that those types of biases exist in medicine. What was likely happening is what seemed like it was something that was objective, which is an objective medical device. But because this device was developed on white Americans or lighter skinned people, it had this horrible impact of improperly um, measuring on darker skinned people. So I think that's a really great example of how, you know, this focus on individual racism is important and we should all think deeply about the biases we carry, but we must also acknowledge the structural ways um, that racism can creep in. Um, even if it's just something as simple as not testing enough black people when you're piloting a device. John, we were talking about this idea of structural racism. I put you on the spot and asked you to define it. And because you're very quick on your feet or had thought about this a lot before, or maybe both, uh, you said that one useful way of thinking about it is racism without racists. And what Tamara's just described with the pulse oximeter seems like A, a good example of that, and B, um, also a, an example of kind of quite how hard it's going to be to close um, some of these disparities. I mean, in some sense, it, it might be easier to um, reduce racial disparities in America if they were caused by a group of kind of bad people going around now sort of doing unhelpful things. But by and large, I think most of the disparities that we're worried about and that everyone wants to close are are not primarily caused by that. And COVID seems like, you know, and the COVID health disparities seem like a good illustration of that. I think that's one thing that makes it so difficult, right? It's, it's, it's easy to believe in a story with obvious villains who are people who you can vanquish. In this case, we're talking about structures and practices, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, usually engaged in by well-intentioned people. Um, but who consequently need to reflect on what they do and how they do it. This is something I, I, I wrote about in my, in my book when I wrote about facial recognition systems. Because they were by and large developed by white men and often tested on primarily you know, subjects with lighter skin, they don't perform well on subjects with, with, with darker skin. In America, that has led to mistaken arrests of innocent African-Americans because the facial recognition programs did not recognize them well. So there are, when you talk about structural racism, there, there, there are sort of two sets of questions. The first is, what are the structures that led us to this position? Whether it's how we test a pulse oximeter or how we test a facial recognition algorithm. The more important question then becomes, what are you going to do about it? So it's, 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 it's one thing to say that, that structural racism is racism without racists, without overtly discriminated without people who discriminate overtly. But then once you have determined that this pattern of racial bias exists, what do you do about it? That is often a much harder question to answer, much harder for a lot of people, because it you know forces people to confront the ways in which they, in which we have been perpetuating racial bias without intending to. So you have to be really reflective in how you approach questions of structural racism. And uh, it's very hard to do that without getting defensive at some point, but that is a that is a stage that 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 people have to work through if they want to promote better outcomes for everyone. I'm John Prido, the US editor at The Economist. I've written a special report about race in America, which you can read by clicking on this link. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and thanks for watching.